Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of One Single Story. My guests today are uh, Pastor Lisa and Pastor Zach, and we're beginning the themes of the Bible, and we're talking about creation today. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. We're going to be examining some of the theological implications. We're going to make some practical applications. So I hope you'll get your Bible out, read through Genesis 1 and 2, and prepare to uh, follow along in this podcast today. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of One Single Story, a brand new year. Yeah, very yeah. exciting. Uh, yeah. We had a whopping one day off. That's the way it Well, <laughs> I, I suspect I had more days off than you did. I mean, a one day off of the podcast. Yeah. Like, nothing aired on the first. This will probably be the second. Yeah. Monday morning. I meant just in preparation. I have had a little bit of a break, a, a, a tiny break. You've been working on the new set that everybody sees. Mm-hmm. You, and Sher- you and Cheryl, I guess. Yep. Put and this together. Zach built the couch. Oh, Zach built the couch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. If it breaks mid podcast, <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> That's going to be an awesome blooper reel. That's all oh, I'm going to say. This is what happens when Zach creates things. <laughs> yes. We'll be talking about creation. I don't need the instructions, you know? God did it without instructions. I, I shouldn't compare myself to God. But <laughs> yeah. We're off to a great start this year. <laughs> yeah, so we have a long-form podcast this year. It's going to be an hour, hour and 15 minutes. It'll be broken down into three segments. So today we'll talk about three different pieces to um, the podcast. And um, we'll look at one specific text. Um, if you haven't already gotten your um, reading plan or your journal, the journals are available on Amazon. Um, the reading plan is in the journal. I believe we'll have a reading plan on you version. That's the fingers crossed. So hopefully it's up by the time this airs. And um, so we hope you'll join along with us. If you want to listen to it all in one setting, you can. If you want to listen to it on your ride to work and back a couple of times, you can. If you want to break it up into three different um, segments. So right now, the podcast, the intent is for the first part of it to talk about why the book is the theme that has the theme it does. And then we're going to talk about some theological implications after that, and then some practical applications after that. So that'll be kind of the three segments that you can look forward to. And um, I hope that you'll join uh, in with us and think about the Bible in a different way. I think this will give us a whole different approach to Scripture. So we're beginning with Genesis. That's the first book of, of the canon of Scripture that we have. And the theme in the book of Genesis is creation or beginnings. Um Obviously, we have the creation story that we're going to talk about today. And um, is there another creation story or a beginning, new beginning? Um, Because I don't want to ruin what we're going to talk about later. You you could what we call creation could be considered a new beginning, too, depending on how you read the scripture. Um, But is there a new beginning or a creation uh, story in Genesis that sticks out to you that you might be your favorite? For me, going to the end of the book with Joseph, we see someone who gets betrayed by his brothers and ends up in some bad situations, but has this restart in Egypt and... Multiple changes. restarts. Multiple restarts, yes. And so I, the story of Joseph is just one that makes me think of, you know, Things go bad. You got to restart again. You got to mm-hmm. restart again. That that's life. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Zach, dang, that was my answer. That's why I, <laughs> I said love, it quickly. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph's. That's one of my favorite things. Like that. Like we have documented in scripture. The story is absolutely incredible. But there are so many just incredible stories. I mean, even the story of Jacob and with his brother Esau and how. You could never think that that could be repaired. I mean, with all that had happened and with him betraying his brother, you know, with his with his mom's help. And uh, it's just a, a wild ride. Of, and, to, and to see how God was able to use Jacob, even though he was not perfect, uh, but that God was able to use him and uh, named him Israel. One yeah. of the favorite stories of sermons I've ever preached, and it, I, I don't copy sermons very often, but I, I I owned up before I preached it, and I'll own up again today that it was a copied sermon. I copied it from Andy Stanley, 
but I'd never seen it before I heard Andy preach it, but it, about the reconciliation of Jacob and Esau mm-hmm. and hiding behind his mother was Joseph watching all of this go down, the reconciliation of brothers, mm-hmm. which it, and it, Andy talked about how when Joseph had that same opportunity, brothers that had done him wrong, mistreated him, betrayed him, you know, um, he offered them forgiveness because he had set an example. And the example that we set has a tremendous impact. And there's a lot of beginning stories, you know, so um, unfortunately, I can't tell you what we would have preached yesterday um, <laughs> it, it, because I'm still choosing between two texts right this minute. But Seth is a start over, you know, so you got Cain and Abel, Abel's killed and and Adam and Eve get a fresh start because Cain's kind of expelled. You know, he's 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 he's, he's gone. So they start over again with the family. You get. Um, Noah starting over after the flood. Yeah. You know, that's like, that's really is like a whole nother creation when you think about it. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a brand new beginning with, I mean, we talk about we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. We're all descendants of Noah. If you read the, if, if, if you read the Bible that, that way, you know, yeah. um, there's all, there's some bad beginnings. So, um, you, you Abraham and Sarah, in Abraham's case, Ishmael is a beginning, but it's a bad beginning. It's a it's a bad choice that starts a path, you know, of, of other things. Isaac obviously is the birth of the Hebrew nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, we we can talk about Abraham being the beginnings of it, but Isaac is the birth of it. Like he's the first one born into the covenant, mm-hmm. um, and you know. We get into there's even a new beginning. The the people of Israel with Israel and his sons and family move to Israel. You know they start all over again in a in a brand new place. And so the book is um, filled with um, beginnings that or creation stories, and that's what we're going to talk about. I mean, it would be nearly impossible, right, for us to say it's the creation okay. and beginnings and not talk about creation. So um, that's that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some theological and practical implications of creation and look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So our text today is Genesis 1 and 2, um, the first two chapters of Genesis, which is uh, the creation story. And I'll read a few verses, but then we're going to talk about some of the theological implications of creation. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. So that that's the first piece of creation. And it begins by saying, in the beginning, God, what can we learn from creation about the focus of the entire Bible? Like what is the way it leads out? What is the one thing that you think the writer of this wants to make sure we get out of the creation story and really the rest of the Bible? that the focus should be? I think it says in a very clear way who holds the power in this universe. And we always are worried about where we came from because it tells us where we're going. So we look at the past to know about the future. And I think that that's what it, you know, God created everything and God will continue to create in our life. And I think that 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 powerful statement there is, is is a powerful statement for a reason because it, it gives us that security in God. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that's repeated so many times is, is that it was good, that God is the ultimate creator. He created everything with a purpose, and he created it all to be good. And we've kind of ruined that, you know, <laughs> like human, just human in our nature. We've ruined a lot of that. But God, the reason why he loves us so much is that he sent his son to redeem it, to make it good again, to make us good. And I think that's 
seeing here the, the the love he has for his creation, the love he has for us, making us in his image, and how he's he sent Jesus to redeem that. All that I think comes together, and you see the beginning of that right here, as it continues to repeat that right here in the first chapter. Yeah, I think it just starts by pointing to God. If it just says in the beginning. The heavens and earth where we're created. Well, then by who? You know, we're mm-hmm. we're led about this divine power from the very beginning. And this is a random question. You said we're concerned about where we came from. Have either of you guys ever done a ancestry test like ancestry? Ancestry. dot com. I, I, I know a ways back. I know, yeah, I, I know a decent amount of like. Uh, I know of ancestors. That's not the Wait, question that, I ask. Did you hear what he's asked? But have you ever taken those ancestry tests, like the DNA like tests? Twenty three and Me. I haven't personally, but okay. my, I have a lot of family that has. Okay, so, yeah. I've been on too many um, TikToks where ancestry tests have gone completely wrong, <laughs> 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 and you find out things you don't want to find out. Oh, I have not yeah. done one. Well, you know. Um, Golly, this is getting ready to go off the rails. There's a documentary w- about this. Um, the doctor. The doctor. What was his name? I oh, oh, man. The do- like um, our father. Yeah, in yes. India, in yeah. Indiana or, or in yeah. Illinois, somewhere and, up there. And that's it. That's and some of that w- was discovered because of yeah. Ancestry. Ancestry.com. Com. They were yeah. like, I got a sister yeah. across town. You know? Yeah. It's a weird thing. They're, I'm also on that TikTok side of things, and there's there's going to be some more stuff coming out. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, oh so that's kind of scary. But I do think we want to know where we came from. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, we're interested in um, – and, and sometimes there are some surprises, but I don't know that that's a bad thing. Like, to, to it can be. It can be life-altering, honestly. But, right. you know, we do want to know where we come from. And knowing where we come from helps us understand a little bit about – you know, today. So the question in the first two verses, because there's a lot of theology in the first two verses. Whew. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the, the second question out of verse one and two is, is this a creation? Is this the initial creation? Or is this a recreation? Is this a new beginning? Um, because there there is... There's a lot of theories about this. I'm, I'm like, just, where are the dinosaurs? Well, where are the dinosaurs? Why Why was the earth without form and void? So clearly it was already present. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't there. You know, it's already there. He doesn't create the, the, that, that piece of it. So I'm just curious. Tell me, what do you think? I've always read it as this is the original creation. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth. But when he created the earth, it didn't have anything because it was brand new. He ju- he had just made it. It's like when you make, it, if you made the canvas yourself, there's nothing on the canvas. Just because you made a canvas, that's not the art yet. You still have more to do. So I think that's that's how I've always read it. But okay, Alicia. I will start down the path of this podcast and is is inevitably going to take and say it doesn't that's not the question it's asking. So it's not going to give us that answer that the, the purpose of the story is what we just talked about. The purpose of the story isn't to be a scientific account where you're tracing all of this, the details. It's a theological story. There is a theological position that says that, there was a creation that was destroyed when Satan was cast out of heaven, you know, and thus we have a, a, a earth that's without form and void. And it, because it was destroyed in, in, in the downfall of the angels. And so this is God's recreation that would have been prior to man. Um, and, and we're going to have some discussions about literal seven days, figurative seven days, the purpose of it. And, 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 and well, I, let's, let's just jump in there I, because I don't, we can make a lot of presuppositions specifically about verses one and two. Now I, there becomes honest debates following that, but verse one and two you got to just make a lot of assumptions. You know, why was the earth without form and void? Was it just, you know, why, why, why was it that way? You know, was it because of the downfall of Satan? Were, were there previous inhabitants to the earth? Um, 
you know, prior prior to this, and they were destroyed. When I mean, we we don't have those answers. We like to think we do, but we don't. But th- that once you get into the seven days of creation or six days of creation, then then there becomes this debate. So the question is: Is this a literal creation, or is it a figurative creation? And does it matter? So, Zach, you've kind of already leaned one way. I think Alyssa probably leans another way, yeah. not just on the couch. But <laughs> <laughs> I, Well, I think that a lot of – when you ask the question, does it matter, I think that you can believe either and still believe in the same God. Like I don't think it's, I don't think it's one of the – our core beliefs. But I do think theologically it changes how you see a lot of things in Scripture. I mean there are times when Jesus talks about things that happen in these first chapters in Scripture or people – when you look at the lineage that goes back to Adam or you talk about and things that like, I think that there is an importance to there being truth in the, and I think there it is true, but could like, and I've seen the argument of maybe the, the word yom, which is the word that's used for day can mean it can be like a yom is like yesterday, yom, like yesterday, this happened. And it's talking about a specific day or a one day. But you could also say back in my yom, like back in my day, which doesn't mean back in one day. It mm-hmm. could mean many years. And so it could be used as either. But um, the, the, the reason I believe it's – I think it's talking about literal days is because like yom – used in from what from what I've researched yam as it's used in the old testament it's used i think over 2000 times but only 36 of those times that is it ever used that's clearly used being like oh a long period of time or like looking back at a time versus the majority of times used in genesis it's used talking about one specific day so i think that it is talking i think as it's saying here i think it is talking about a specific day but as you said does it matter if God wanted to take a million years for each of those days, he could have. Um, I even heard the scientific argument like, oh, is God lying? You know, if he makes a tree that is that, that looks like it's 100 years old. No. I mean, he made man from what we read here. If he made man, he didn't make a baby and raise the baby up. He made a man, you know, and he made a woman. And so I think that. There's there's a lot I can break down here. I really want to talk about this, but I'm curious to hear. Alyssa's That's what we're here to do. I know. What, what fun is this, <laughs> Alyssa? So for Yom, I think even if you were to take it that it meant the word day and not a period of time, we look at Second Peter and we see that to God a day is like a thousand years. That's true. So to God, time. When there aren't other things to keep time, time is different. I don't mm-hmm. think we can fully comprehend time not existing. Um, and the sun and the moon aren't created till the fourth day, which would be the timekeeper yeah. to, to some level. Um, and so I don't know if uh, to me trying to fight and say, and I know you're not, you're not fighting this, but like trying to fight and be like, man, it's a literal day. And we have, if you don't believe that, I think we start down a path where we get, get so ingrained and worry about things that aren't that important. And then we're worrying about that instead of showing people the love of Christ. You know, I think we, yeah. it's, 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 you can go down that path. And I think if, if one archeological dig or one scientific discovery could upend your faith because if you believe that and then it gets upended to me that's not a faith that's built on solid ground yeah so the young earth old earth theory science is becomes a challenge there are multiple pieces to this story i found it interesting so i have one i keep a limited number of books beside my seat where I sit all the time and I read, I work with my laptop, you know, it's there. It's on a little bookshelf in a, in our den, whatever we call it. And uh, one of the books I keep there is a book called systematic theology. And in it, he says, so this is the second edition. This in the last couple of years um, that it came out. But in the first edition, he um, wrote that, in the next 20 years, that 
the church was going to go one way or the other. Either they were going to, that science was going to come, bring things enough to light that the, even the scientific community was going to fall to a young earth or to an older earth. And But it shouldn't affect our theology. Um, I think the key here in the beginning is in the beginning, God. That's the that's where we've got to drive the stake, right? Not the time, because I don't I don't I think there are certain things we don't even understand. Even for example, in the last days, what what is in the last days? You know, right? Yeah. It, it, it's that same. It's the same word. You know, and even mm-hmm. sometimes it's singular in the last day. You know, and um, th- that becomes it becomes complicated. The argument on the other side, because. You know me. I'm going to try to see the whole picture. The argument on the other side about literal days is that it specifically says morning, evening came and morning came, which is a sundown, sun up. Even though we don't have a moon, if you had asked me when I was your age, though, Mm -hmm. how old are you? Twenty six. Um. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Twenty five. Twenty six. Twenty six. When I was your age, this would have been a stake in the ground kind of issue. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably for you too. When you were younger, maybe not that old, or a maybe stake in the heart you, issue. At least you know, a teenager, going probably. At it. This would have been a stake in the ground kind of issue. Um, it's not. It's not for me anymore. Uh, it's not. It's not. I don't even see it as a debate that I want to be involved in. I want to talk about it. And I'm happy to talk about it. But like, if you're going to argue with me, like that, I am a theological idiot because I don't see it the way you do, then I don't want to have a conversation with you. I'm happy to, I'm happy to debate with you about it, but there, because there's, it is so nuanced. It's not, it's not as straightforward as we want it to be. The concept of time for me is different than the concept of time for God, completely different, you know, because God, I mean, when we think about Jesus being slain from the foundations of the world, that is a, incomprehensible to me. And and the truth is, let's assume that the earth is four and a half billion years old or whatever they say. I don't, let's just assume it's some ridiculous. That should lend us, lead us to a, a more, un, a, a better understanding of a God who sees in broader pictures, not just, well, it can't be our God. You know, that's the thing I would say even, that's the difference between the church and the scientific community. The church drives a stake in the ground and says, some, not all. This is either this or nothing. You know, the scientific community, on the other hand, um, and I listen to a lot of people that it, it's not unusual for scientists to be atheists. It's not unusual for that to be the case. But the one thing that they will say frequently is there is some kind of divine design you know mm-hmm. this didn't the, the the theory that this just happened out of nothing right probably more agnostic than but, but probably so yeah they don't they can't they can't pin it that's that's correct that would be a better terminology agnostic not atheist they there is some higher power they can't explain it they don't understand it because they understand like if we were to take this iPad apart in, in all of its individual pieces and drop it in a bag and shake it for a billion years, the probability that it's going to come out as an iPad is virtually zero. Mm-hmm. Not mean, and no matter how many, they understand that. And and the thing about it is you would have all the exact parts that you needed to make the iPad. Mm-hmm. you know. And so the belief that this randomly happened is it's not even true in the scientific community. For the most part, they, they will acknowledge there is some kind of divine implementation in 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 the earth they're just going to debate how it came about and they want to know i don't know how y'all feel about that well even like thomas aquinas one of his big arguments for the christian faith um was that something had to start everything you know there had to be something before the beginning something or someone an entity outside of time that started time right <laughs> like the, it had to be started at some point uh, and where did it all come from people make the argument about the big bang and then even if you talk to people who hold that belief which is not held by most people in the scientific community anymore but they would say that well maybe that big bang was started by another big bang and that one started by another big bang 
well, what started the first Big Bang? You know, <laughs> it's like a bowling ball doesn't roll itself. Something had to set everything in motion, and we know that to be God. And is the Big Bang really that different than God speaking things into creation? If you, because we, God it here is removes, a breath. Yeah. It, like that is what we, like there is no figure of God. And so in, in Genesis one, and so if you were watching that on play on a movie, it would seem like the Big Bang, I would say. Yeah, well, it's, it, it's, uh, it's misplaced faith. Is what I would say, you know, and even things like the, it's a belief that something miraculous happened, but they don't want to attribute it to a God that people might worship. My the place where I land today is I have I've never doubted, still don't doubt, have no doubt whatsoever that God is the author of creation. Um, whether it was seven days, seven thousand years seven billion years, it's irrelevant to me. You know, did a million people walk through the Red Sea or did a million one or two million or 500,000? It don't matter. The miracle is the fact that the Red Sea parted and they were delivered. For me, it's the, 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 the beauty of creation is not how fast it happened. The beauty of it is that God had this vision and, and was able to create it. And I think... It's important that we know that science isn't the enemy. I think a lot of Christians, sometimes they they get in their bubble and they are scared to let certain scientific things be taught to their kids and things like that. Like science isn't the enemy. All truth is God's truth. So if we find this truth and we we can make it work with the Bible, like I think I think we need to not make science the enemy. Yeah. Well, I my, the the scientists that I hear, the agnostics are not anti-divinity. They just want to be able to explain it. That's their bent, mm-hmm. and they can't always explain it. So, But I can't discount what they say. On the literal side of it, is Adam a literal being? Is, is he a person? I mean, I would argue yes, because we see the lineage that goes all the way to Jesus. And I do think that is an important part of scripture that scripture continues to remind us about so often that I think that there, there's gotta be, why would you just have a fictional character that leads to, that leads to Christ? You know, I think that, I think that is an important part of the story that from the beginning, whatever creation happened from the beginning, there's always been a plan. There's, there's, Always, God has planned it out so perfectly, even when there was famines, even when the people, Israelites, were enslaved, even when babies were being murdered. I mean, with everything that happened, all of it, the way that it all worked out so perfectly, it's like that. It's like what we see in creation that there's got to be some divine power that's making this happen, that's helped this get all the way to where we are now. The fact that we have the Bible today is a miracle in itself. The, the the world that we live in is a miracle in itself. And so I think that, I mean, I would argue that I do believe that Adam is a real person. And, and I mean, Jesus talks about him. The disciples talk about him. And I don't think it's because, and if he isn't a literal person, that's one of those things that I might put a more of a stake in the ground on that. But um I mean, I don't think like so, if someone doesn't believe that he was literal, I don't think that means like oh, you're not a Christian. I just think it, it, we would have de- definitely different theological views. Um, and I'm curious to hear what Alyssa has to say, but because, but uh, yeah, I'm, uh, that's where I stand on that. Um, I would be the first thing I would say with that question is it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> The second thing I would say is even in the story, we see um, he's not even given a name. He's called Dirt. And so I, I I would lean towards the fact of probably not a literal Adam. I, I would lean more to the literal side for Adam, mainly because of Jesus. Reference back to him, um, the lineage, you know, I, I don't think that— It's a theological divide that I'm going to go. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't even think any of this that we're talking about today is a determiner of whether you're a 
follower of Christ or not. Like that's yeah. that's 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 a terrible. It, but some people measure. will. Some oh no no no! Is, you're not. There's no doubt yeah. about that. There's no doubt about that. I, you're, I'm 100 percent in agreement with that piece of it. But um, I, I would tend to f- f- lay more at that uh, on the literal side. But uh, the honest answer is. I, I don't know that I give it a lot of thought, you know. Um, yeah, I've thought a lot more about if they were literal days mm-hmm. than if Adam was literal. I don't know if I had really worried about that question before we started preparing for this podcast. Well, because well, even with the thing, like if it was like a million years or a billion years per one of those days, right? Because God is outside of time. It could have been whatever. Um that could lead to some things making more sense with like dinosaurs and things like that. And that like, well, if humans came to the very end of it, you know, <laughs> the very, the- well, look, the, it, from a scientific standpoint, mm-hmm. all of the growth and, and nutrients. And I read this random book. I don't even, I do know why I read it. I read it because it was a recommendation from Tim Ferriss. I listened to Tim Ferriss mm-hmm. occasionally and um, he's an agnostic. He, I think he would have qualified himself as an atheist years ago, but he's more agnostic now. But it was a, it's really about trees. That's all the book was about. It was like a 400 page novel. And I look back on it and go, I cannot believe I read this book. But anyhow, it was pretty, it was weird, way weird for me. Um, but a lot of the scientific information, like how many species live in the rot of a forest? that are beneficial to the world, that if we take take it out, then then the world suffers. And the fact, let, let's, I, I believe I serve a God that's smart enough to say, okay, I'm going to create man at this point in the future, and they're going to need all of these things for their own health and their benefit and to survive. And so I'm going to create these trees, and I'm going to let them die, and this rot begin, and this the, the all of these things. Things be born into the earth so that when they arrive, they can survive. You know, you have to you have to give God that much credit. You know, Mm -hmm. God's smart enough. We're not. There is this concept also in that we can derive from this passage about six days of work, one day of rest. However, in order to arrive at that concept, you've got to believe in a, a literal six days and a literal day. And, I, and to argue for <laughs> Alyssa. <laughs> Alyssa, say, Alyssa can handle it. She can <laughs> hold her own. Well, seeing uh, how this is my like 10th day of work in a row, I better believe that it's not literal. <laughs> Uh, I think that like even I mean even there like even if it wasn't a literal even if it was a figurative you know if, if, if even if that was the case it's written this way for our benefit you know the the way it's in here the way it's recorded is perfectly how, how God wanted it recorded for us you know sure and I think that that is it is very important that even if it wasn't even if it was a second even if it was seven million years whatever it is it, this is important for us and that it it. It, God's showing us the design that he has for our lives that will be beneficial to us and our relationship with him. Most likely Genesis came together. Now, there was oral traditions. There were probably written things at certain points, but it came together during the exile, most likely is at least what I would lean towards. Um, and so I think that that was important there. And I do think that if it, this was the only place that it talked about rest, then maybe we would be like, oh man, if it's literal, if it's not literal, then maybe God didn't mean that. But I think rest is talked about all of scripture, even in the New Testament, where we tend to think that some of these other laws don't apply. Rest and Sabbath is talked about. Yeah. You know, it's not referred to as the Sabbath here, you know, and there is a there I, in my preparation, I was surprised to find the debate about whether we could even call this a Sabbath or not, because the the intention of the Sabbath. I didn't realize there was that much debate about it. I, I've always seen it as the picture that God wanted us to spend the majority of our lives being productive, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But he also wanted us to be intentional about resting so we could be more productive. I, I think the tendency for many people who are workers is to point to people who we think don't work enough, you know. Um, and 
this this concept of rest is that God would do it. It's, I don't even know that it's physical rest as much as it is the the concept to appreciate what has happened in the previous six days. Does, does that make any sense? Like, because yeah. God didn't need to rest. You, well, you know? don't. Yeah, he's, he's like he's infinitely powerful. I mean, like he could, he didn't have to rest. He rested from what seems from scripture. He rested for our benefit, and like you said, to appreciate all that is good that he had made. Um, verse twenty eight is the one that says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, um, the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on on the earth. Is this still a mandate today? So I would argue that it is that like we call it the cultural mandate in that we're called to subdue the earth, take care of it. um, And that like, it's kind of one of the, I, talked with a few students in the past about this because they someone was making the argument that Christians don't care about the environment <laughs> and that, and uh, and I could after talking with them I could kind of see where they were coming from uh, but I think it's clear from scripture like God put so much effort <laughs> into making the world we live in but the fox- only, he did it in six days so that wasn't actually well, that much effort <laughs> <laughs> yeah right I mean he, what's he been doing the rest you, of the uh, eternity what's that, you like can move mountains in six days. So I, I, when God is like, I think like give yourself some more credit, give God some credit. <laughs> so I think, so be fruitful, multiply. I don't think humans generally have a problem being fruitful. Most of the time they need to be less fruitful. Um, <laughs> but you're talking about Christians and the environment. So that is something like that. It was surprising to me that I found out that Earth Day, which was actually started by a Pentecostal, and that um, a lot of this conservation and things that there are some Christians who are like, it's our Earth, we can do what we want with it, you know, use it. And I think Christians should be the ones caring for the Earth and making sure that we're, we're not harming the environment beyond, you know, what is repairable. I think that that, that's something we need to care about. Yeah. So the flaw of theology where that's concerned is dominance um, instead of stewardship. And they're not the same. Right. Mm -hmm. A dominant says I'm in control and I can do whatever I want. And whenever that happens, there's trouble. When it happens in the church, you know, when somebody says I'm in control and I can do whatever I want, Bad things happen. I mean, we've seen it uh, uh, thousands of times played over. If we see it as stewardship, I've been gifted this. And I think, in my opinion, so I tell people this often, and you may hear me say it from time to time in a sermon, um, there's two themes in the Bible, salvation and stewardship. This is what we've been given. What are we going to do with it? The the entire theme of the Bible is we've been given the gift of salvation. Now, how are we going to steward it? We've been given the gift of the earth. How are we going to steward it? I haven't always thought that way. You know, I, I've, 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 I've been, a, I have, and oddly enough, the thing that changed my thought process was not even the Bible, even though I started reading the Bible differently. I took a class at ECU. Um, so it's been, I'm certainly in the last 15 years, but probably the last 10 or 12 years. It was essentially this merging of, uh, science and money. I, it was like an economic biology class. I don't remember what it was. But the the process of it made me change some things that I, I do. So I'll give you some examples that I think about because now I recognize my obligation to be a steward. When I go to, a, to the bathroom and wash my hands, I try to use just one towel. I, before that, I would have snatched off three or four and, you know, wouldn't thought anything about it now. And it, 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 I can get a soggy towel every once in a while if my hands are too wet. But it's just a simple thing every day. So you and I live in the same neighborhood. I walk my dog. My I have a goal when I walk my dog is to pick because I have to pick up his poop, which is something I can't even believe I'm doing to begin with. But I I. Better than some people in our neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Yes, there's some horrible <laughs> people in the neighborhood that don't do that. But 
my goal is to pick up one piece of trash every time around, just a random piece of trash. And usually it's something small. I picked up a floor mat the other day. Somebody, <laughs> I don't know. How, I passed by it three times hoping somebody would come back and get it, you know, but I thought, well, they haven't come back after three days. I'm picking it up. So, but is one piece of trash make a difference? No, but I'm a steward and I have to, I have, I'm obligated to do those things. And if we view relationships, life, the earth as stewardship instead of d- d- dominion. Mm-hmm. You know, dominion is not I'm in control. The president or a king, that is easier when we think of dominion. Um, it, that That's his domain. But his obligation is to do what's in the best interest of the people, not just what's in his best interest. I I, I really need to ask this question just because for fun, I I, I want to ask it because we, we need to wind this piece <laughs> yeah, down. Now, now I'm worried. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 because I, it's a legitimate thing. I I'm, 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 I I want to have a discussion about how does the creation of male and female direct us today. This is a place where Alyssa and I have some differing views, not completely, okay, not, I, but we have an understanding. I think she tries to listen to me. I try to listen to her. We both try to learn. Um, you know, we could call it complementarians, egalitarians. I think those are the um, theological terms. But th- there's a lot of theology that's directed from this passage that that feeds throughout the Bible, throughout culture even today. There are things in our church that um, we we view this way. Um, the 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 passage the the way I read it is God created someone to come along beside of Adam. Uh, we could call it a helper, helpmate. That would be the terminology some people would use. Um, it, it was from him. To complete him, that's how I see it, and then that's part of the reason why I take the complementarian view uh, a little bit more. But I'd like to hear from the two of you because you come from a, a certainly a different generation than I I do. You come from different backgrounds, and you you, you hold different views. And I think this is this is another issue where the church drives stakes in the ground, mm-hmm. and we divide instead of trying to understand one another and. I just like to hear how you think the creation of male and female drives theology where men and women are concerned today. So there are, I don't, we probably won't have time to discuss it, but there are two creation accounts here. So we have Genesis 1 and Genesis and then three. Genesis uh, 2 starting in like verse 4 Okay, um, where it it says when God made the heavens and the earth and it kind of starts over. It's, it's a complete, completely different telling of creation in a different way without the days, without all of that. Right. Um, and so in the, the first one, it says, so God made human beings in our image to be like us. It will rain. Like, so the very first time it isn't even that God made Adam and then Eve, um, and the, what I would like to say is if, like, there's kind of this hierarchy where it's like building and getting more important. And so if women was last, then I don't know what we do with that. <laughs> Save the best for last. <laughs> best for last. Yeah, I think that, like, kind of like you were saying, Steve, there are so many arguments that people will go back to this scripture specifically to to win it out and people will fight over these kinds of things and um not they aren't important but i think that some people base their entire church everything they preach on everything they do on what's derived from the scripture or and just to to fight certain battles because this is the hill we're going to die on um, without showing people who Jesus is, you know, and they miss out on the opportunity to show all the rest of who God is to people. And some people um, miss out, whether it be women who are mistreated, uh, whether it be uh, people who just have very different lifestyles than us that, they want to know about God, but they feel they can't come anywhere close to a church without being judged. Uh, and I think that it's our responsibility, like we're talking about being good stewards, stewards of our, our faith, and that 
we have an obligation to, I think, to study God's word, to know God's word, but also to be in a place where we can share that with people and not immediately attack people for what one thing in scripture says. Though I do agree with, I mean, like, uh, yes, he did create the male and female in the garden, but, and I do come from a more conservative background. I, I am, I'm pretty conservative, but even with that, I think that as scripture talks about it here, I think it's important that we do, this is how God created it in the natural order. But I think people so many times can weaponize certain scriptures to, and that that's the hill they'll die on. And um, I don't want to die on a hill. I want to bring people to the hill with me. <laughs> well, <laughs> die together. <laughs> we'll die together on this hill. <laughs> I don't think there's anything in the passage that gives us the right to weaponize it. That's that's the first thing I would say. Um, my my view of of the complementary piece is that. Men are not complete without women. Women are not complete without men because if you take the first account, you know, a piece of Adam was taken to, to create second Eve. Second account. Second account, okay. Mm-hmm. That in, in that account, you know, it becomes it, 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 out of the side of, you know, beside. It's not, it's, it's not a hierarchy kind of thing at creation. But there is a there, – there are some things that complement one another. How that works in the church, though, then becomes this becomes a real battle. I mean, it really does. This is a real trouble point for me, honestly. It, it just is a trouble point. Some of what we find in the hierarchy piece only comes after the fall, you know, not 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 at, in beginning. I think for me, the theology that I can clearly walk away with is the intent. For me, this I'm I'm just going to speak for me. I don't want to make anybody else have to speak to what I'm getting ready to say. I think the the theology pieces that I can walk away from is the intent of the covenant relationship should be between men and women. That I think that can I can I can stake drive a stake in the ground there and have no problem with that. But how that plays out often looks different. It looks different at your house than it does my house, and it looks different in, and than it does at your house, you know. And even over time, I think that evolves because um, you two have kids at home. I don't have kids at home, so the responsibilities of either person in that relationship certain suddenly changes, you know. And 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 what those people do, and I think it is a comp. It, it's it's a struggle to figure out that comp complementary role, no matter what, because I'm. I'm not self. This, there are some people who are going to really take issue with me about this. I'm not self sufficient in myself. One, I need Christ, but two, I need other people in my life to help shape me and complete me because there are things that I can't see and will never be able to see. I'm blind to them, you know. And the same is true for for you guys. That you need other people in your life, and 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 so that's how I, that's how I see it. I think we. We put we put too much emphasis on the created first, created second thing when I don't even know that that's the intent. Because it, it, that's the only thing, let's just be honest, that's the only thing in all of creation God said wasn't good. Right? Night and day is good. Water and earth, good. Fish and sea, that's good. All of it's good. He created man, it's not good. Right. That's what he, that's that's the only thing he said in all of creation that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. And so there becomes this acknowledgement that you are I don't want to say you're imperfect by yourself, you know. But I think beyond just male, female, because there are people out there that are called to live single. Unix, or, that's right. That's, so, what, that's right. That's so Paul I think, would say that. So I think that it's just it's it shows our need for community. We mm-hmm. need people mm-hmm. around us. We cannot be self-sufficient. That is not a way that you can live there. You have others around you. 
you help them, they help you. It's community. I think right. that's the yeah. bigger picture here rather than just looking at it as 100%. a marriage. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, even too, as you look in like chapter two, we did a we did a relationship series and it wasn't just an entire series on why you shouldn't date, <laughs> which I think a lot of, I think some students might have left it thinking that, but we talked about relationships and dating and it was a really good series. But one of the things we talked about was from the Genesis account in chapter two that like it. He was like, it's okay to be single. Like, that's okay. But like, and he was, he did not find his purpose in Eve. He was given his purpose by God. He had his purpose before he had a person, you know, and that God gives us each purpose and we we shouldn't look for our purpose. We shouldn't look for our meaning in another person. However, in that they could do it together. Like it's, it's a beautiful thing if you can find someone to do that with, to, to, be partners in life together in that. Um, and I think it can make it easier. I think it's, I need the support a lot of times, you know, and so having that is a great thing, but you're not less loved by God if you don't have another person and you shouldn't seek your purpose in another person that that comes from Christ alone. Yeah. I don't think we realize until you start having a conversation like today, how much of our theology is built on the first few words of the entire canon of Scripture. I mean, yeah. so much of it, relational, creational, you know, all of those things, you know, the the vertical piece of it, the horizontal piece of it. I don't think we recognize the, the theological implications until you get to talking about it, and it's pretty substantial. All right, so let's take a few minutes and talk about some of the practical applications. With every passage, we're going to talk about theological implications, but we're also going to take practical application. This piece usually is easiest for me. That's typically how I think, what does the Bible say, what I'm going to do about it. I will say, I think it's good for us to have the theological conversations too, and recognize that they're an important piece of the process. The practical applications, though, are in the creation story, we, we live in America um, self-made whatever, you know, I, I'll read, he was a self-made millionaire. He's a self-made whatever, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Um, there's a tendency, particularly in our culture, to give ourselves credit for whatever we've achieved. Um, how can we be better at acknowledging the fingerprints of God in our life, that this this was actually God at work, not just our own ingenuity. I think it starts by a daily prayer, thought, remind, self-reminder that God is sustaining us every day. It's, it would be hard to not recognize God in the little moments and then be like, oh, this big promotion is because of God's favor. Um, if we're not taking that time daily, when we remind ourselves in the little things, then in the bigger things, it's almost just obvious. Yes, God, God provided this. God, God is working things out. God is, you know, whatever kind of language you you use for that. God is contributing to this. Yeah, I've I've been going back to old prayers that I've prayed that I like wrote down, and like just seeing how. God was able to work out things like I, I when I look back and think I'm like man like I'm proud of this like I I did this or I got this position or oh I like I was able to you know e- like weave my way into this but really when I look back I'm like there was no possibility that, like if God wasn't involved in the majority of good things that happened in my life uh, they would have never happened I mean it's it's so clear it's like pieces had to fall so perfectly that the the fact that I am where I am today. Uh, I'm blessed in the ways that I am today. Like there is no way that it could have happened without God. I think that, and even, even looking back and looking at the the bad things that have happened in my life, the things that were some of the most difficult times in my life, I look at those things and I see, I can see God working through those things too. And how even God was able to use some of those to make me who I am today and to get me to where I am. Uh, and so I, I think it, I think when in the moment and even looking back, if we forget to remember God, it's so easy to take all the credit 
have a lot of pride in ourselves. So it's important that we take time to look and see, like, to, when you really look at the details and, and, and even the prayers that you prayed at those times when you're going through difficulties or when you weren't sure what you were going to do next, it, it, it can be very humbling. You know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's been, it has been humbling for me. As a leader, you, you get way too much credit and way too much blame, either which direction it's going. <laughs> but people often remark about the church and, you know, those kind of things. And I try to always respond by saying it was a great church before I got here. And it'll hopefully, if I'm a good steward, be a great church even after I'm gone. Um, the fact that I have an opportunity is clearly the grace of God. God's allowing it. I have to be a participant. I don't want to get anybody to miss out on the fact that we have to be a willing participant. You know, God can open all the doors he wants to. If we don't walk through them, they're useless. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't realize how God works, even in the worst of circumstances, I think the harder time is to see his fingerprints in the best of circumstances. You know, how... Um, He's still making things, shaping things, you know, evolving things uh, for our benefit. And I think it's dangerous. Um, and uh, an American culture is the worst, is we think we've achieved something on our own. Um, and if if it's not for God's grace and God's handiwork in our life, I don't you know I don't know where we would have ended up. You know any of us. Um, you know part of in the theological portion, Zach, you mentioned he had a purpose. That Adam had a purpose before he had a partner. Um, How do people know their purpose? How, do, how does the average person know what their purpose is? Is it derived from Adam? Is it already predetermined? Or is it individual? I think there are purposes that we we all serve. You know, I think that just as humans being created in the image of God, I think that we are called to take care of the earth. You know, uh, I think as, as believers, I think one of our purposes is to love your neighbor as yourself to, you know, to be like fishers of men. You know, I think those are things that as believers, those are our purposes of ours. But I do believe that too. I think there are individual purposes that I don't think I'll even know, like even being here, I don't know the purpose of uh, all the purposes God has for why I'm here. Um, until you look back like years later and see how, somebody's life was touched, even if one person's life was brought to Christ by what I'm able to, what I'm able to do here, that, that in itself is purpose enough. You know, that's all I need. And I, and I hope God can use me in ways like that. Um, and I just try to put myself in, I, I pray for, to God for wisdom and I try to put myself in positions or put myself in places where I'm able to fulfill those purposes that I believe that I'm called to. And I think one of those is teaching and just walking alongside people in Christ. Yeah, I think there is a lot that is laid out in scripture. And I think a lot of that is our purpose. And there are other parts that I think are individual, like what giftings, mm -hmm. where your gifting meets the world's need is one kind of phrase that I've heard is kind of you find your purpose in that. Um, but I, I think it's a little bit of both. Okay. I, you know, I think there are general purposes. I would agree with that. And then there are specific purposes. You know, nobody can say I'm not required to steward the earth. Like you can't. Um, but whether you're expectation is to preach or not, you know, it's a different, it's a different animal. And I think that it should become more and more refined as you get older, you become more and more realize, okay, this is, this is, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. And, um, I, I think that that's extremely critical. So the, the place I think we can spend the most time 
on practical application is in this concept of six day work week, a Sabbath, rest, that kind of thing. I, because I less we probably all struggle with that. I I'll testify I do. Um why is a six day work week week right? What should a Sabbath look like? What's too much work? So let's talk about that. So what what's the right amount of work? It, is it hard to know? Um, how do you determine it? What should a Sabbath look like? I think it's just important to take rest in general. You know, I think that I, I'm kind of one of those people that I like to be stimulated at all times. Like I, I, there's always a screen on, um, you know, there's like a, if if I'm I get bored very easily and maybe that's just like my generation's thing but and but if I actually take time like if my phone dies like that's usually to my benefit <laughs> you know it's like if my if my phone actually dies like and I just have time to become like that's when I have my best ideas and things like that when like when I'm just in the shower and it's just like and I'm like don't have my phone and I can just think about video ideas or ideas for like lessons or things like that. I mean, that's, <laughs> it's like one of those, it's one of those times when I, you have a whiteboard in the shower so you can write your ideas down. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately though, I only have a wet erase marker. So it just, everything just vanishes as soon as I write it. So I really got to remember, but, uh, but it is one of those things. It's like when I actually take time, even though I, I hate those times, I feel like, Oh man, like I hate to not, have something going on or not to be working on something at every time. It's those times when I am rested, when I think that I, I'm able to grow my relationship with God. I'm able to have better ideas and be my best self a lot of times. So I think it's important. I try to take at least a day of Sabbath. Um, and, and I think it's really fine for people to take two days off. You know, most people work five day weeks and then have the weekends, but, um, Intentionally, I think it's important that in one of those days to spend time in Scripture. I, I mean, hopefully in every day. I would hope for people to spend some time every day in Scripture. But if you can only get one day, spend some time in Scripture, in prayer, some time away from all the distractions of the world just to focus on God. And I think that that, I think, helps me be more well-rested. So I think the catch here— is probably slightly generational, but um, it's six days of work, but work isn't only the job that you go to get paid for. Work is the things you need to do around the house to keep up, laundry, mm -hmm. dishes, even cooking would be considered something that they wouldn't do on the Sabbath in, in the Old Testament. They would, yeah, we would have- find, We'll find that- out in the next book. Yeah, spoiler alert. Well, it's, we don't talk about it, but in Exodus, right. you know, they, they, they have to gather enough manna on day six, you know, so they're not out gathering it, right. you know, and cooking it. And so it's hard when, if we were to say, and I don't know if you meant like a six day work week as in like job work week. Um, but I think I think you have worked a job where they said it's six days. You work I, six days. Yes. Right. I, yes. And so yes. and so I think we need to be cognizant of the other work that we do in life, because I for a while I did. It was like, OK, I'm taking a I'm taking a Sabbath and I would not try to work on the church, but I would be doing things around the house. And I was like, this isn't this isn't rest. This isn't rejuvenating. Um, it's it's cleaning and it's all house of that work is not rejuvenating. Right. And so not for me. And so I think that that's one thing that like they find. I wish I would have looked up this these kind of studies and things, but like they find that even like a four day work week as in like a job work week that people are a lot more productive because they're more focused when they're there. They, they have time to get away for a week, a long weekend. Um, so I think that. Which is usually out of the question for us. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think that, I think that there's um, a lot of different factors at play there. Um, like family situation, kind of what, you know, how much work are you expected to do at home? What's the, the labor load there? The thing that as I've, as I've studied rest, I, I guess I've studied rest. Um, 
There are seven types of rest out there. And I, I really hadn't considered that there's different types of rest. I kind of would probably consider a day of rest. Like if I can like sit and watch TV all day. Um, but these are the seven types. And if you want to know more, there's like a Ted talk on it and articles and things, physical rest, mental rest, social rest, spiritual rest, sensory rest, emotional rest, and creative rest. And we all need those in different levels um, to, to have a balanced life. Do you think of rest in different categories? I suck at it. I mean, that's the bottom line. I, <clears throat> I, um, well, I'm going to ask a question, then I'll give it a different answer. How do you know when you're not resting? What, what are your signs? I get grumpy. I'm falling asleep at work. <laughs> I've seen that out of both of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Is that how you notice? Well, I think, I think I'm more on edge. You know, I think, um, if I find myself bragging about how much work I'm doing, I'm doing too much work. <laughs> you know, if I'm like, yeah, like, oh man, like I, I, I pulled an all-nighter to work last night. Like that's not something I should be bragging about. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's gotten too far when it's at, when it's at that kind of point or when, you know, and sometimes I, I also like to, I like to serve people. I like to feel like I'm benefiting other people. And sometimes I'll go out of my way to do that to my own detriment. You know, I, I have trouble saying no sometimes, even when I really should. And I think that's something that even though I want to people please, um, I have to take into consideration, like I have to rest. That's important. Um, physical rest, yes, sleeping, but also like you were saying, like it's overstimulated creative. I get my creative rest in the shower. Like what I was talking about before, like th th that list you were talking about, I think is all of those things I think can come with just being very self-aware and really purposefully taking the time to say no, even to yourself sometimes, and just to do, um, maybe don't charge the phone for a little bit, or maybe go on a walk, you know, those things can be, I mean, I hate walking, it's the worst, but you, Steve, I know you like to walk with your dog. <laughs> I just like to walk, yeah. yeah. The place I notice it the most would be the second one, mental rest, that you listed. Um. There's nothing in any of the jobs that I do, the businesses I own, the, the work here at the church, that's too physically exertive. I mean, they say preaching is high physical labor. I I enjoy it. And I you do pace a lot. I know, but I don't I don't I don't notice it. Do squats so in mad. that chair. It's so Sometimes mad. Sometimes you can't decide whether you're gonna sit you down know, or I'm not. Sit down and stand. <laughs> um and and so I I typically it's not the overexertion of my body that that is going to be a problem. But mentally, um, I can overwork. Right now, as we're recording this, I'm in one of those places where I feel like I've stretched my mental capacity. Um, and I'll tell you how I notice it. When I notice it, both of you will appreciate this. Um, so I'm at a space. I don't think I've not preached a Sunday since August. I'm pretty sure I've preached every Sunday since August. I come back from a trip to Europe, and I think I've preached every Sunday since. I think I have um, since early August, which is 22-ish weeks in a row. Preaching for me, the preparation, the mental strain, the preparation, what am I going to say who am I going to tick off today? You know, am, am I going to reach the right person? That's the that's the heavy piece for me. And I I can't tell you the last time I preached that many Sundays in a row because usually I'm trying to take enough off that, that that's not a problem. Um, add to that the podcast, um, which was extra heavy after that because we missed almost the entire month of July, so we're doubling up. Then we're preparing for a new year, and then I have business situations and other things that I've put my fingers in on top of things that are kind of out of my control that create a lot of mental stress. And And I, I the place I notice it uh, the most, and I think both of you will acknowledge this, is I become more combative, um, where I'm just being challenging for no reason. 
Like, no, no, there's just no apparent reason here to be this engaged in this, you know, situation. <laughs> I can't think of what you're talking about. That's weird. Yeah. You? Huh? Wow, really? Yeah. And, 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 well, it's, it, I've had conversations with the, both of you, not mm-hmm. neither in person there, you know, because we, a lot of what we do is remote. So we're messaging, you know, about stuff that when I'm done, I go, you're just a little bit too uptight about that, you know. And I, I don't, I will, I don't believe I was ugly. I don't think I was like, but I was just too engaged about it. Like it's just, there's no, just shut up and leave it alone, you know. <laughs> and so that's where I notice it the most is when I've stretched my mental capacity out to where I, um, I, I, I notice it where I become combative unnecessarily. You know, I just want to debate for the sake of debating, which is something I was hoping I was growing out of. What were you going to say, yeah. Alyssa? I think each personality type handles burnout differently. I don't know if you would consider what you've hit a burnout stage and di- probably different definitions of that out there. But I, I remember looking at an Enneagram, like how does each Enneagram act when they burn out. And for eights, it says they push harder and do more and make the other people around them do more. And I'm like, oh, (laughs) that might explain a few things of just like when we were hitting like points, like you just kept pushing us and pushing us and not trying to diagnose you with burnout or anything. But I just think that that that's your personality. When you start to get stressed, you push harder. Yeah. I don't, when I don't disagree with that, like that's where I notice it is. Um, and it is even just today, you know, in a we're having a goal setting conversation, and my foot is on the gas. You know, just <laughs> we've got this long list of goals, and I'm not letting up. You know, and it can be some of that can be just stress related. You know, how much more do I have to do? And I, but I do know, like I'm I'm at a place where. I could use a break and I'm hoping to have one here in a month or so, but um, just, okay. I don't have to prepare content. Like, I mean, I don't think anybody has any idea the pressure that you have you because you two have had to prepare to be on these podcasts. It's not like you can just walk up here and just start jabbering. You're going to sound like an idiot. You got to read the text. You got to find, <laughs> huh? People probably think I am <laughs> that I well, am do that. You, you have to be prepared. You know, you have you have yeah. to read not just the text. You got to read what it means. You know, you got to be able to come in and have a a conversation about a Hebrew word for day. You know that has various meanings and be able to be able to, to do it. And 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 I know some people think, well, you don't have anything else to do, but. We got a there's a there's a lot of things. I know. I mean, I, there are people who think, well, you don't have anything else to do. What else have you got to do? You, you work know? on Sundays, huh? Yeah. You only work exactly. on Sundays. <laughs> um, and you know, and so I, I think for me, the place the place I struggle to rest the most is the mental rest. Not, it, I think creative rest was on there, but I'm always thinking about what's the next thing. You know, was that. Am I right? Was that right. one of them? Creative rest. I think that would be like, like creative rest would be like building Legos or doing an art project or something cooking or something like that, where, you know, you're doing something, but it's not like for necessarily this large purpose, I think mm-hmm. is kind of the, what they mean by creative rest. All right. Last, last thing. Tell me about a time in your life. Um, when you needed a restart or you got a restart or a, a new beginning that might encourage someone? Uh, one, one time I can think of was when I was working at the best job I ever had, Buffalo Wild Wings. So <laughs> no, I'm just joking, Better than this one? No, definitely not. But uh, if I was working at Buffalo Wild Wings and the, the business closed down and it was really sad and then I was like in between like multiple jobs and then I found a job like working at like the supermarket and I was just like in a place where I'm like, gosh, like I felt such a lack of purpose in my life. Like I, I just like 
everything. It just seemed like such, everything was just awful, you know. But I discovered like at an event that I volunteered at with uh with, with Caleb that I was like I really want to do something in ministry like I really enjoyed it and then I got the call to 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 work with them and, and to work for them and um and like that was a restart for me and that led me down the path which has brought me here now and even though like the road has not always been nicely paved you know and there have been times where I've caught kind of uh fallen like in the gutter and whatnot like the that was a huge restart for me. And then in coming here was another restart for me. And I think continually God has um, opened doors uh, for me in my life that 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 have been a restart for me, that have been like a, almost a new creation in my life that um, have been at each time, even though yeah, each one comes with new challenges, I continue to grow every time it, there's new i'm learning new things every restart and so uh god is the god of of not just second chances but third and fourth and fifth chances and um he has done so much for me that i don't deserve but i'm thankful that he's still keeping me along for it i think one of them was after um after Tyler and I got out of college and we were, the economy was bad. It was things we tried to do just didn't work out. And we had somebody who was like, I want to start an art gallery. And we sat and had conversations with them. And we went and we started an art gallery that was also a ministry aspect to it um, in downtown Cleveland. And it kind of got us out of the the funk that we were in and it gave us a, a fresh start um, and a focus and something that we enjoy doing and relationships. And it was, um, it was a, a God meeting because the way we met this person wasn't just like, you know, natural. It was like this person introduces that person, you know, it was, it was, it was a restart that we needed. Yeah. I, I I have multiple places in my life that were clear restarts, but my me being here at Open Door was just a clear restart. You know, it was <clears throat> the I, sometimes people ask me, you know, about my life situation or whatever. <clears throat> so I was a pastor before I went through a divorce, which is career suicide. You know, it's. It didn't matter how it happens, it's still career suicide. And then the tribe I was in, it was definitely career suicide. And um, I floundered around for a few years after that. And um, Easter, the Saturday night, actually, before Easter of 2005, um, I had been Pastor Jay's pastor previously and uh, at the first church I pastored. And he was attending here at Open Door. <clears throat> he had never been a pastor. That's a fairly new thing for him. He had not been a pastor before that. And um, he was attending here at Open Door, and I knew he attended here. And I called and said, look, we want to come to church tomorrow. Is that, are you good with that? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to embarrass you. I mean, that's really kind of what I was asking for. And so anyway, we came to church for the very first time Easter Sunday of 2005. And um, I don't know, two or three months after we came here, um, the guy that was leading worship came to me after service. He said, I heard you played the drums. You know, would you be interested in playing with us? And I said, sure. So I brought my kit the next week and I started playing the drums. And that is clearly the path that everybody expects to take to be the pastor of the church, you know? <laughs> and, um, but it was a door that I, I didn't know how it would ever open again. You know, I remember the first time I was asked to preach here. Um, I remember the first time I was asked to preach somewhere else and, you know, that, that whole journey. Um, but I look back today, you know, people that walk in today, they don't see all of that. They don't even know all of that. You know, there are people here. There's probably a hundred people here from that time, maybe more um, that know my story, know me when I came in, you know, but it, it, it wasn't 
it, it was a clear restart. It was an opportunity for God to do something new. And what I would tell people practically that are listening today is whatever it is that you think is the end of the road, it can never change. It can never be better. It's all over now. Um, God can restart it for you. You know, there's there's a re, there's restarts available after divorce. There's restarts available after death. There's restarts available after bankruptcy. You know, there's just there's there's opportunities after it feels like everything is messed up. And if you go back to creation, if it was a recreation after the fall of of Lucifer, it should point us to the fact that it's an opportunity to restart. There's plenty of, Joseph is the is a beautiful picture of that. No matter what situation, I mean, he ended up in slavery, then he ended up in prison, and every time, God, let's let's hit the reset button. And so don't 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 feel like it's the end. That's what I would tell people. Don't feel like it's the end. There's always an opportunity to start again. So, anything else that we didn't cover, y'all wanted to make sure we covered. I'm excited for this year. I'm I'm really looking forward to the podcast. What it's a new beginning. How exciting is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, there you yeah. go. We recreated the podcast. Yeah, that's all good. over again for an hour. We're at an hour and twenty five right now. So huh? we're a lot of talkers. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, it's been a fun discussion. There's so much to talk about in the book of Genesis and especially the creation story. So much of our theology is rooted in these first few words of Scripture. I hope you'll think about it today. I hope you'll follow along with the reading plan, stay up to date, and prepare uh, to be with us all year as we look at the themes of the Bible.